there's some issues about all that. So, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie Brown. He's in Charlotte, and uh, he'll sit up here, make sure if you have questions, I can respond. So, Excellent. Here, questions. So, Charlie, you're on now. Okay, Alan, thank you for the introduction. I was getting ready to say that we go back not quite 50 years, but if we start talking about 50 years ago or 47 years ago, you and I most, we, we both must have been three years old. Uh, exactly. And, yeah, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to share with you guys today this group. One of the topics that I consider, it's really a passion of mine, particularly when I'm working with elite performers. And I only gave a really good description of what I'm doing. I'm director of Get Your Head in the Game, which is a consulting firm where the whole basic premise is that we help elite performers in a variety of areas, be it performing arts, sports, business, high-risk occupations, consistently perform at high levels at their optimal abilities while hopefully maintaining a sense of balance and sanity in their lives. And at, through my work with elite performers, I've got to say that recovery is probably the area that I see as being most critical because if you're an elite performer in the world of business, sports, or any place, you know how to work your fanny off. And you became an elite performer by working harder and smarter, usually, usually harder and smarter than the other people around you. And what I find is that when we're really looking at sustaining high performance, Recovery is the key, and it's uh, it, it's just a passion of mine. I spend more work, you know, focusing upon recovery with my Olympic athletes than I do with anything else. I spend more work with surgeons and with and I, with all my business clients. I, I, recovery is just essential. And what I'd like to do today is to have a, the opportunity to talk about why recovery is important and really talk about the interrelationship between stress states and recovery, look at the consequences of recovering in balance, and talk about the implications for elite performers, supervisors, and consultants. And I'd like to have ample time for question and answers at the end. Uh, and if something has just a burning, burning question along the way, like, hey, wait a minute, I don't know if I buy that. Alan is my, my moderator host, and feel free to say, Charlie, can we stop on this and can we talk about this? Um, so far, let me get a little bit of see. Are we on target right now? Does this sound like a legitimate agenda for us to cover in the time we have set aside today? I need to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, we're rolling then. Okay, the whole notion of recovery, and let me also back off and, and a little bit and say is that I went from a traditional clinical practice to sports psychology practice, and then from sports psychology, I've actually been one of the leaders in making the transition of applying the principles that have been well-researched and documented with athletes to the other areas of performance. And so I, I really do ground a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today in, in the research that we have with elite performers and starting with athletes. And everybody knows that training makes you stronger if you're an athlete, right? Well, actually, wrong. Training does not make you stronger. Training actually, when you have a hard workout, training breaks you down at a cellular level. Literally, the cells of the muscles break down. And you only become stronger when you recover from the breaking down process. And if anybody's ever done any weight training, they know that you, you know, there's, it's a common practice. You never go work on the same muscle group twice in, in two consecutive days. Uh, 
when you, you work out, when you train those muscles, they tear down. When they come back and recover from that, that's where they come back stronger. And if you look at performance immediately after exercise, it's, there's a decline in performance. So if you look at the horizontal line is time and the, the curving line is what happens with performance, is that immediately after you do this hard workout, your performance declines, and then as time passes, you're able to recover, and your, your performance then increases, and actually you have a little bump up when you get stronger. And normally in physical training, you have this gradual incline over time where you continue to increase. Okay, we've got that's performance, the blue line, the blue arrow is pointing at time. You have to have time to be able to bring your performance back up. You think about it, if you've ever done any exercise, you get out and do a hard run, and somebody says, well, go run again right now, your dog tires, your performance is down. It is cellular. It is hard. It is, it's the hardware instead of the software. Now, the leading researcher in the area of athletic recovery is a fellow by the name of Michael Kelman. And Kelman says very clearly that optimal performance is only achievable if athletes recover after competition in optimally balanced training, stress, and adequate recovery. Well, it's not just athletes. Optimal performance is only achievable if individuals recover after exertion and optimally balance daily stress and adequate recovery. Uh, and to me, it's important that we look at the general components of stress states because we really are talking about recovery balance. And we're talking about, you know, balancing the stresses that an individual is under with recovery efforts that an individual participates in. And the components of stress states, there's always the physical aspect, particularly when we're talking about athletes, is the exercise intensity, duration, level of fitness, and whether or not a person is injured. But there also are environmental factors where the physical surroundings can increase, can increase stress states. If you have tons of interruptions during your breaks, that increases stress. When we look at how we train Olympic athletes, there's, there are training periods, and then there's supposed to be non-training periods where they have breaks and they're supposed to recover. If they have tons of things that they have to do during those breaks, that is not good recovery. That increases stress. From a psychological standpoint, you can have both just the general mental and emotional aspects of what's going on with the person. Are there things that an individual is worried about, concerned about, uh, both emotionally and also mentally? Are you having to do a lot of problem solving? Uh, if you have an athlete who's moving to a different location and has to figure out all the logistics of getting the move in. Those add to the stress states. And you look from the social standpoint, group cohesion and the interpersonal relationships. You know, those can be the added factors of stress, stress states and uncertainty, just not knowing when there is uncertainty in life. That is one of the greatest contributors, external contributors to the sense of stress. Now, these stress states are all applicable originally from the research with athletes, but they also clearly have comparable implications for people in the world of business, where it may not be your exercise intensity, but it's the intensity of your work, the intensity in the duration of your work, your general level of fitness, are you, are you healthy, are you tired, are you coming back from a cold, all of those aspects impact that cumulative sense of stress. Okay, are we on board with that? Is that making sense so far? Give me a yay or an A. Okay, now let's look at recovery. 
And by recovery, I'm talking about anything that is a reduction or a change in the stress demands. And since the research in this area originally comes from, from athletes, we're talking about the physiological aspects of recovery, where there's a reduction in exercise intensity or duration, or from a business standpoint, it's reduction in work intensity and or duration. When, from a physiological standpoint, sleep is one of the best factors of recovery. If you want to get more recovery, get better sleep. Nutrition, hydration, just simply drinking water, engaging in some form of alternate activity. Uh, what we do with Olympic athletes lots of times if somebody's training one special discipline, for example, the whitewater kayakers that I've worked with, they will go cross-country skiing during the winter and sometimes just changing the activity, changing the venue, that actually is a move for recovery where it reduces the stress states. And then there are a number of proactive strategies such as stretching, massage, a number of things just for self-care and self-compassion. You also look at the psychological aspects of stress states, and we're talking about relaxation, both physical relaxation and mental relaxation, emotional support, who do you have around you that's giving good emotional support? Your general sense of well-being, sense of personal accomplishment, a sense of self-regulation. It's, uh, it's amazing how it is a, in, an important factor for generating that sense of recovery if you feel like, you know, I, I have my balance right now. I, I can determine how upset I'm getting about this right now. I can really sort of control where I am emotionally with the situation. And sometimes just having environmental changes where if you're, if you're in a good, comfortable physical environment, that can make a ton of difference in terms of recovery. Okay, how are we doing with making sense with recovery states when the components recovery right now? Still good? Okay, I can't see the head nod, so I need the verbal. Uh, now, to me, this slide is really, it's the core. If, if you look at the sort of red, you know, lightning bolts that are on that upward curve, those are increasing stress states. If you look at the little smiley places, sunshines going down, those are the increasing recovery demands. And the green arrows tend to show the relationship between it. If you look at the stress states on the left-hand side, you've got two of the little proverbial balls of stress states. And so that's really low level of stress. The thing is, is that each level of stress requires a corresponding level of recovery. And the higher the stress states, the greater the recovery needs are. Now, if your stresses are on that far left where it's really low, you know, if you recover a little bit, you can go back and jump up your stress states a little bit, or you can go back to a lower level of stress pretty much. But as you get to that second grouping where there's three of them, you need to get at least a comparable amount of recovery. And if you get that comparable amount of recovery down to those little yellow smiley places, you can then go back to the lower stress, but continue to work up the curve. And if any of you have ever done any weight training, uh, the analogy there is really pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's a really nice analogy because you may be able to max out a weight, pushing a certain weight. You go back and recover. You don't go back and immediately jump up to your highest weight. You go back to a little bit lower weight, you warm up, you get to your highest weight that you were last time, and then you can usually push it up a little bit higher. So you tend to continue to jump up, increasing the stresses, in the stress load that you can handle. But in order to do that, you've got to hit the corresponding amount of recovery that's there. Now, does this relationship with the balance between stress states and recovery demands, does that make sense to folks? 
Okay. Well, the thing is, it's it's really good conceptually, and it works also. It also applies to the concept, even if we're we're talking about you know mental work, general activity in the world of business and offices, and it's always wonderful to think that you can continue to always balance your stress states with your, um, your recovery demands with your stress state. The thing is, there's a limit. There is always a, a limit to your resources. I mean, how many times have you thought, I just need more hours in the day? And if you reach a resource limit, and that can be you need more time in the day. It could be you, you, you lose some of your administrative staff. It could be that you, know, you lose some of your support at home. Your wife's on, my wife was on vacation in the mountains. It reduced my resources you know, in my household. But you hit a limit to your resources. And when you do that, that means that you cannot go back. If you look at those, the, 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 the relationships on the right-hand side of that graph, you see the dotted red lines. You, you need to be able to go back to those upper levels, but you haven't done the adequate recovery to be able to do so. And your resources limit literally to find your stress capacity that you can handle at any given point in time. Because the key, if you're going to be able to perform consistently over an extended period of time, you've got to work in the range where you are balancing your stresses, the cumulative stress that you're dealing with, with your recovery efforts. Now, if you start pushing your stresses beyond that, you're going to start going into recovery imbalance. And I, I want to talk about that in detail because every elite performer, be it business, athlete, surgeon, whatever, there's times that you go into recovery imbalance. It happens. But the key is how long you stay in that area and how wisely and rapidly you get back to in that area of recovery balance. The optimal level is always in that green zone where you're balancing whatever the stress demands are with your recovery resources. Are we making sense on this one also right now? Good. Okay. Now, if you look at that balance between stress and recovery, in this chart across the top, these are the terms that come from sports and athletics where we're talking about the balance. To me, we don't have particularly good language for the world of business and other areas of performance, but we're going to use this. Across the top in the colored areas, you'll see you know, we're talking about what happens in the relationship that we're calling training what's happening in what we call overreaching, what we call overtraining, and then overtraining syndrome. If you look down the far left-hand column, we're talking about in that relationship, what is the outcome of the balance between stress and recovery, what is the impact on performance, and what are the recovery requirements. So if you look in the green column, of training, what we think about training. And in the world of business, this would be, okay, everyday regular activities. Usually after a period of training, everyday activities, the outcome is acute fatigue. You're tired at the end of the day. However, your performance will tend to increase and you can recover after one day. That's nice. That's, if you're in recovery balance, that's really good training. If you move over to where the balance is overreaching, you're in a period of recovery imbalance. And every elite performer does this. You'll have a, a, an, an athlete will have a training camp. An athlete will have a long, hard weekend. 
a business person, you're going to have a project deadline. You've got to crank things out. It requires more time, more energy, and you go from that period of balance to where you're overreaching your that balance on that. And you're going that the outcome is you're in a, a brief period of recovering balance, and actually you have a temporary decrement of performance. You know, an athlete will be a little slower. A business person will be not quite as sharp, quite honestly. And your recovery needs, if you're in that overreaching phase, is basically you need a long weekend or a week to get back in shape, to pull it back. And, you know, you have a long period, and so, okay, you've got a three-day weekend to take care of things, or you have a light week. And it doesn't mean that you have to stop work altogether, but there needs to be a reduction in the stress demands and increased recovery efforts. But you need to put the, the, that whole relationship back in balance. If you move to what is considered the overtraining relationship, that's an extended period of overreaching where you've been in recovery balance for, uh, for m more than you know, three, four, five days. You haven't had that, that you know, recovery that you need the additional three to seven days of, of reduced stress and recovery. And if you enter that phase of overtraining, which could be you're working towards the end of the calendar year or the end of the fiscal year, You've got all contracts come in due. You've got all, you know, all, you know, it's around tax time. There could be all these things. The impact on performance is there's going to be a short-term decrement in performance, and it takes two weeks to recover. And that means you've got to reduce your stress demands and increase your recovery efforts. Two weeks. If you continue to push that recovery imbalance further for you don't get that two weeks to recover, you are then at risk of entering into an overtraining syndrome. An overtraining syndrome is an extended period of that overtraining, and that's when you really get underperformance, staleness, and burnout. And as this scares everybody to death when I say this, but if you really are in an overtraining syndrome, this is a physiological basis of imbalance that takes a full month to recover. And, and I realize that people say, oh my gosh, I can't take a month off. I've got to say, I have worked with athletes who have lost their career, professional athletes, one who lost that person's career because they went to an extended period of overtraining syndrome and would not take the time off. I, w I worked with a young swimmer who was a regional top star. This guy was rated, written up as a junior into all of the, the, the regional papers of the top swimmer, that person went into recovery and balance, not because of what they were doing in training, but because of what happened in their family life. And it wasn't even happening to them. It was happening to their brother. And it put that whole stress recovery in out of balance and they kept thinking, okay, I'm a hard worker. I can do this. I've always done all these workouts. And they wound up their senior year in high school and literally having to stop swimming. And when they're being recruited for colleges, they took the 28 days. They recovered. They, the good news is they went back. They went to college. And they were walking for the swim team and got earned a scholarship that way. But there's no shortcut around the physiology. And if you look at what happens when it gets out of whack, the physical symptoms of recovery imbalance, you know, you elevate the heart rate, you start losing weight, muscle pain or soreness, your, your blood pressure starts going up even when you're resting, and you start having GI difficulties. 
What happens also is that where you used to be able to go and recover from either a, a, a day's training or from a workout or from a day at the office, and you find, I'm just not recovering the way that I used to. You're liable to have a loss or a decrease in appetite, just severe fatigue. If you're an athlete, you're going to have overuse injuries. If you're a business person, you're going to get keyboard injuries. I, I've got to say, if I go through a long period of pushing on a deadline, I start getting almost like a carpal tunnel thing in my hand from using the, the mouse. Your sleep patterns are liable to be disturbed and your immune system starts changing where you start getting immune system deficits and the probability of you coming down with an upper respiratory infection skyrockets, absolutely skyrockets. These are the physical symptoms. And there again, we're ta if you think about a computer, this is not a software issue. This is a hardware issue. And let's particularly look at what happens with goes on with the psychological symptoms. If you get in that period of recovering and balance, an individual starts losing self-confidence. They start having increased sense of drowsiness and apathy, irritability, shorter fuse, just emotional motivation changes. You can get that general sense of sadness almost for no reason, can become more anxious, more angry, hostile, irritable. You can have confusion and concentration difficulties in boredom. And there again, these are psychological symptoms, but they're driven by hardware issues. And I hope that analogy fits with you, this group, where when we're talking about what's going on between your ears and what you're feeling and experiencing, you really got to look at, it's like with a computer, is this a hardware issue or a software issue? And these are, hard, these are hardware issues that have these symptoms. And I've got to say, in the world of athletics, these psychological symptoms are usually the most common reasons that a coach may refer an athlete to a sports psychologist. And if you only look at, okay, what's going on, like it's a software issue, and if they're still in that period of recovering balance from a physical standpoint, from a hardware basis, it's like you're swimming upstream. Uh, I, if you're doing any work with computer, get your hardware straight before you start trying to tweak the software. Um, yeah, that's probably a good place. Are there any questions at this point with looking at the whole notion of that balance, what happens when the balance goes awry between stress states and recovery? And Alan, you can act as mediator if have the people, you know, express their questions to you and if you can relay them to me, we can ensure good communication. And you'd like to get into any slide or discussion as to what specific stress you be aware of and recognize to avoid excess stress? I, I'm having trouble. Can you translate to me? I, I'm having trouble hearing that. That's a little bit muffled. Further in your uh, speech, are you going to cover specific areas? Specific areas of, um, of stress in a business person's life that we could, for some examples that we could be able to identify and avoid going over the threshold of excess stress and having too much recovery time, needing too much recovery time. Okay. I, if I'm hearing correct, Alan, will you translate that again to make sure I'm getting it? The question really has to do with going into that the serious imbalance on a business standpoint as opposed to an athletic standpoint? What are the uh, things you need to look out for before you okay. get that serious imbalance? Excellent. Specific examples from a business standpoint as to what happens and what to be looking out for. Let's go back to that slide. Is this one that we're looking at? Is that balancing stress and recovery? Is that the 
the the the the relationship in question. Yeah, if you took the athletic um, words that you're using and converted them to business, what's the point at which you would recognize that you're in that overtraining uh, the overtraining syndrome? Or, uh, Excellent question. Excellent question. When you start to go into overtraining, look at your general sense of fatigue. Look at your general sense. Actually, look at the physical symptoms as to are, are you finding that it takes longer for you to recover? It's, it's like do you find that it's, you're, you're dragging getting up in the morning. Do you find that you're having a little bit of difficulty with your GI system? Do you find that you're having difficulty sleeping at night? And are, are you having any changes, a loss or decrease in appetite? Also, look at your sense as to what's going on with you emotionally. What happens with high performers is they tend to write off all the psychological symptoms. They're saying, oh, well, this is something that's going on psychologically with me. And actually, it's liable to be triggered by just the level of work that you're having and are you taking enough time to recover? Uh, are you finding that you're getting more, you know, are, are you getting a little bit more apathetic? Like, what the heck's going on? Are you irritable? Are you short-tempered? Are you noticing a change in your motivation? It seems like you're sad and anxious for no reason. And since recovery is usually not on the radar for most people, often a business person will look for something else in their environment to be able to explain the change in moods. Well, you know, my, you know, my spouse is just being unreasonable or else it can be all of this, uh, you know, just looking for something external. What I encourage everybody from business to do is put recovery on the radar because the it's it's a myth that you can continue to increase the stress demands without attending properly to recovery. And let me move on to if if you look at really what you want to be able to do, this is a slight you want to have everything in your life if you're an elite performer of high quality. If you look at the, that's the bell shaped curve and you want to have, you want to be doing everything in your life in, or, well, I should say, optimally, to be everything in your life in that upper end of quality. And athletes, we talk about physical training. For a business person, we talk about general workload, education that you've got going. Mental training is looking at, okay, how do I do with concentration, attention, focus, um, look at office efficiency, and also have a positive environment. Do I have a good work setting? Do I have a cheerful setting that I feel very good about? And those can all be high quality. We know that those can help improve your performance. If you look at what's going on, on the right-hand side, though, look at what you're eating, look at how much water you're drinking, and look at how much recovery you are building into your daily life. <clears throat> and nutrition, I, I can't tell you how many people have gone, and if we start looking at, you know, I've had some of my business clients when they talk about how they're more likely to do errors in late afternoon, they're more likely to go and to be irritable with some of their subordinates in the late afternoon. And part of what we do is say, well, what are you doing with fuel? How much nutrition are you putting in? Concentration requires a lot of energy for that part of your brain. And it's amazing how somebody has a protein snack, a, you know, a carb-protein combination mid-afternoon. All of a sudden, they stop going into meetings and having short temper at the end of the day. You want to be proactive in looking at your nutrition, looking at hydration, and hydration is purely water. Jim Lear, L-O-E-H-R, has a wonderful book called The Power of Full Engagement. 
And Jim always talks about one of the best things a business person can do, and he talks about the corporate athlete. One of the best things you can do is make sure that you're drinking you know, 64 ounces of water every day. What we know from our work with athletes is that if your hydration levels drop, your physical performance decreases. Well, guess what? The same thing's true with your intellectual performance. It decreases. And you want to make sure that you're doing recovery efforts in that high end of high quality. Your recovery, making sure that you take time to get outside to do if and you don't have to go to the gym. You need to move. And the, it's, I always like the idea of the three free. The three free recovery efforts are you know, it's nature, music, and laughter. You know, ideally, exercise is wonderful, but if you get outside, I can't tell you how many people will go. I mean, I've had uh, CEOs take their lunch, leave the office, go outside to a park bench, and sit and read the sports section at lunchtime. And, get, and their productivity goes up in the afternoon. One of the challenges is that our business cultures are such that if you're not at your desk looking very, very pensive, people think you're not working. And this is really a cultural and a mindset change if you begin to recognize, you know, I'm going to be a better performer if I go and recover. And we know this from the work with elite athletes. We know it from the work with the U.S. military. And we, we know that from the work with surgeons. I'm doing work with surgeons right now. The implications for business have to do with any elite performer where what I really hope for you today is you really need to understand the relationship between stress, recovering, and performance. I mean, that's, that's it. And in my experience, recovery has been overlooked in, in, in actually in the world of sports for decades. They're a lot better with it nowadays. Sports in the, in the military are doing really good with pulling it back in line. It is still uh, you know, the, the culture of medicine. You know, I've, I had two physicians in my uh, a couple uh, that was married, two physicians. And they saw that chart and they said, oh, my Lord, now I understand. We used to be able to, if we're tired, to have a long shift during the week. We had a demanding week to recover after a weekend. When we had our first child, it took a week's recovery. When we went and got our second child, a week recovery or a long weekend just would not do it. And they're going into recovery and balance. And one of them actually went and changed careers to be pull things back in line. But you need to, to put it on your radar, understand that relationship, and that recovery is actually a way of sustaining performance. And you want to proactively learn strategies to deal with performance and non-performance stress. We know that that's one of the best predictors. What are your stress management techniques? How much are you getting with physical exercise? There's a whole area of mindfulness and mindfulness meditation and you really want to practice active recovery techniques. Active recovery is different from passive recovery. Active recovery is something that sort of fills your bucket up. Active recovery is going for a walk on the golf course. Active recovery, it, it can be physically expending a little bit of energy, but it's at the lower levels of energy. Or it can be doing something with friends, walking with friends, walking with a partner, walking with a spouse, where you're having a conversation, you're being active. Passive recovery is better than no recovery, but passive recovery is laying down on the couch watching TV while your brain falls out your ear. Um, or else going home and having the, the madman, the old, you know, three cocktails or whatever, that's passive recovery. And while passive recovery is better than no recovery, active recovery is getting to that high quality 95th percentile that you want. 
And you really want to monitor your stress recover balance and recognize the symptoms of recovering imbalance. Recovering imbalance is always individualized. It's very idiosyncratic. There's a couple of instruments that we use sometimes with high-level athletes, but quite honestly, it's too time-consuming for most folks. But you want to rec- you want to put recovery on your radar. You want to monitor it and recognize when you start getting out of whack. And one of the first things you want to be doing is saying, hey, I, I need to take more recovery time. I, I, I'll give a personal example, and any time I give a personal example, you need to take that with a grain of salt. But I'm working on a deadline for next Monday where I know I'm going to be working a long weekend. Okay, I know my recovery needs, which means I've got a light schedule next week, and I'm going to make certain I schedule two runs with my dog. And it's like, Monitor it, recognize it, be proactive whenever you need to be, and seek help if needed. Um, If you look at the implications for supervisors, coaches, and consultants, there again, people are in a position of responsibility need to understand that relationship. And you really need to educate your elite performers, supervisors, and consultants on the importance of recovery. You want to monitor your elite performers for recovering and balance <clears throat> and encourage supervisors, supervisors to make recovery strategies a regular part of, what, of the work culture. I have the privilege of working with what I consider to be an, an incredibly high-functioning legal team. And one reason they're so high-functioning is everybody on that team, starting with the head of the team, the head of the department, The head of the department has a background in athletics, and that person knows the importance of recovery. When that person, when I start consulting with it, I start talking about recovery, and they got it. They build in recovery efforts. They monitor what the staff is doing, and if they literally see one staff member doing a series of of, 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 major task where they're overreaching, the admin knows to lighten up their schedule. And the supervisors will go back and say, you just put in this amount of time, and so you need to take a couple of days off to balance with that. I realize in the world of business that for many cultures that sounds ludicrous, but if you're going to run a marathon, and business work is harder than athletic. A football, professional football player gets to rest every two minutes. And a football game you know, lasts what, two hours. You get up every day, five days a week, and usually going eight hours a day, sometimes ten hours a day. I think business is actually more taxing in the long run. Business is an endurance event where you have to deal with the physical and the mental aspects, and it's analogous to running the marathon. One of the major reasons that people burn out and crash on marathons is they don't take time to walk and drink and eat at the aid stations. So you want to incorporate those same principles in the world of business. Okay, now I will entertain any and all questions. How's that? Uh, What you got for me? You kind of did address it. Um, what does recovery look like? Okay, I need a translation. And, and I'm just, uh, Alan, can you relay that to me? Your, your voice is a little bit more clear. Uh, the question was, what does recovery look like? Recovery, it's, it's going to be... First, it's, you've got to des- decide what recovery looks like for yourself. Any times, it's the, the key is, is it going to be a change in stress states where you reduce your stress demands, and it will be some form of activity that you find rejuvenating. Um, It can be uh, anything, and and there again, active recovery is better than passive recovery. Uh, Active recovery is going for a walk. 
taking the dog for a walk can be a wonderful recovery ask a recovery action. If you're thinking about, oh, let me go back and enjoy, you know, what's going on outside. Let me enjoy if you think I have to take the darn dog out, it's not going to feel very much like recovery. You get to say, okay, let's go out and smell the flowers. Playing golf, you know, any form of exercise, listening to music, having a good meal, singing in the choir. I mean, you go back to Richard Harrison, Vanessa Redgrave and Camelot, sing. Uh, anything that you find that is not work-related, where it sort of energizes yourself, playing with your kids, playing with your grandkids if you're fortunate enough to have them, going and watching one of their t-ball games. Uh, you think about things that bring a smile to your face, and if you're not certain about it for yourself, one of the first things you can do is start making a list of things that you know tend to fit in your personal recovery category. They'd say, okay, and I always say, don't just think it, ink it. Uh, under high levels of stress, the first thing, one of the first things that goes is your memory. And if you want to remember something, it's like go back to what's the easier multiple choice or fill in the blank. Recognition is always easier than recall. And so if you have a list of saying, okay, these are the things that I know tend to sort of refill my bucket, make a list, put it down, and then if you're saying, man, I am having a rough time today or I'm feeling a little tired, rather than going back in the habit of falling down in the chair or whatever and then picking up your, you know, going back to your office right after work, Make sure you do something from the list. And it really is going to be up to you to do something uh, for, for you to determine these are the things that really I find good recovery. And be aware that what you find as being recovery may not be what your spouse or your partner finds as good recovery. Recovery is in the eyes of the beholder. The, the main thing is to be mindful and proactive with putting it on your radar and realizing that recovery, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's essential. And if you go back to what's really some of the fundamental recovery efforts, sleep. And, uh, okay, show of hands, how many people average at least seven and a half hours of sleep a night in that room. Give me a hand count, at least seven and a half. Okay, how many count? How eight out of uh, eight, eight out of 14. Okay, good. Okay, you guys are doing good recovery. The other six, I would encourage you to start looking at what are the, the impediments to you getting that seven and a half hours of sleep. Seven and a half hours of sleep is really sort of a magical number. Um, if you're not getting seven and a half hours sleep on a regular basis, you're liable to not be going into stage three of sleep. Stage three of sleep is when the body heals. And you actually can be hurting your immune system. Yes, you can become adaptive to it, but are you optimizing your performance? Are you working in that right-hand side of the bell-shaped curve where you're doing high quality with your recovery efforts? Sleep, hydration, drinking water, um, and eating good food, eating good healthy food. I, I've always been surprised that chocolate's not on the list, but I, I, there is some research that shows that chocolate can be beneficial in small doses. So I always say, when in doubt, have a little bit of chocolate. Just don't go nuts with it. I've got another question, Charlie. Hang on a second. Sure. I do have a Uh, the question okay. has to do with the 28, did you hear it? 
Uh, no, can you help me, please? Yeah, the question had to do with the 28-day recovery. And what if mm-hmm. you work for two hours of that 28 days and then forgot about business the other 22? Did that fall into the area of recovery? Say again. I'm not sure I thought. Say again, please. Hang on. 12-day patient is ideal. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The key for sustaining the marathon, though, is making sure that you do good energy management, which means balancing all that discomfort you're doing with good recovery. And I've got to say, um, it is a challenge because it, it, it's against the culture. I know at the Olympic Training Center, I've got uh, my good buddy Sean McCann, is head of sports psychology there, and he'll jump all over an athlete about being lazy. And this is one of the hardest working, hardest training athletes you'd ever see. And the athlete, you know, Sean's, you know, he's about, you know, five eight and he'll go toe to toe with some guy who's six three and he says, What do you mean I'm lazy? And he says, Lazy is not wanting to do the stuff that you know is good for you, but you don't particularly enjoy it or like it. And for a lot of people, for a lot of serious athletes, they're being lazy with their recovery. For a lot of people in the world of business, it's the same thing. It is emotionally uncomfortable to think that going to the park bench, being outside and reading the sports section at noonday, I, they, they get very uncomfortable with that concept. That's being lazy with recovery if you recognize that relationship between recovery and performance. And if you're looking at long range for a career in burnout, the the best information that I've ever found research on burnout actually has to do with uh, teenage tennis prodigies. But the findings, in my opinion, are applicable to the world of business. There's two factors that you know, predict burnout. First, is does the person have an identity other than that of their area of performance? If all you know is your work, if all you think of is yourself as being a person working hard, then your probability of burnout starts skyrocketing. If you have an identity of saying, yeah, well, yeah, I've got my work, but I've also got my family, I've, I've got my partner, my spouse, I've got my grandkids, I'm a grandparent, I've got my friends, I've got my running buddies, I'm involved with my place of worship. If you have a, an identity other than just your work, then you can sustain your performance you know, much, much longer. The second factor that predicts burnout is how much control you have over your schedule. If we know that with teenage tennis prodigies, and I definitely know that with the business executives, and particularly as there are those of, the, those of us who become more chronologically gifted uh, to the degree that I can control my schedule right now, I can regulate how tired I am, my recovery efforts, and I can keep going for as long as I want. Okay, other questions? Thank you. Thank you, too, Charlie. Thanks a million. We really appreciate it. I, well, it is an honor and privilege to, to be here, and I really do. This is an area that I'm very passionate about. And if you'd like, I have recorded this webinar, and with your all's permission, I'll send Alan a link to it. If anybody wants to go back, look at it, or if you have a business colleague you want to share it, I'll keep it up for, uh, make it available for the next two weeks. Okay? Okay, that's great. Hang on. Okay. Hang on. Wait, you're going to send the link to me, right? I will send the link to you. I, it, it may take a little while for it to process. Uh, but I'll send the link. And if anybody wants, has any additional questions, the slide has my general good stuff. But you can also get in touch with me as, at Dr. Charlie at headinthegame.net. Check out my website. I've got tips for business folks and performance of all types there. Uh, but I welcome serving as a resource. And I welcome, I, I really, my hat goes off to you as a group for your interest in this area because in my experience this is really cutting edge 
of making sure that you optimize performance and you sustain your ability to perform at that elite level. And just the fact that you had the interest to ask me to participate, it says a whole lot about you as a group and you're ahead of the curve there. So thank you for the privilege. Good. Thanks a million, Charlie. Talk with you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.